Welcome back, everybody, for another AoE4 Civ rundown tech tree thing. So, uh, last time I did the Holy Roman Empire, and this time we're doing the Mongols. Again, in case people uh, are not as familiar, in AoE4 there are eight civilizations at launch, each of which is pretty darn different from one another, and some, like the Mongols, actually have very unique mechanics. So that's why I'm just doing these quick little tech tree rundowns give you guys the idea of, okay, here are their bonuses, how do they work? I'll try to mention some of the unlisted Civ bonuses when I can, because they do exist, and uh, my apologies if I miss those, but yeah, let's get right into it here with the Mongols. This is, of course, my favorite Civ in AoE 2, and the Mangudai, my favorite unit, but uh, we'll get to him later. Mongols are considered a three-star difficulty civilization, which is totally accurate because these guys do not play like your uh, your average Age of Empire civilization. So we're, we're looking at something that's closer to Chinese than uh, Franks, French, when it comes to uh, how weird and like different they are. The in-game uh, time span says 1000 to 1500 CE. This is completely arbitrary. I have no idea why this is the, the chosen time. It's like, you know what? Let's just do 500 years. Eh, that sounds about right. And uh, their focuses are on aggression, nomadic, and mobility. All of these are quite accurate. So I was just going to go through uh, all of the Civ bonuses as per usual, but I decided that, okay, we just need to sort of go over how the Mongols work, just on a basic level. So they are nomadic, which means that at the beginning of the game, you start with six villagers, your Khan unique unit, get to that in a second, and a packed up town center, which will, um, you, you know, move around and you have to place it on a, uh, you know, wherever you want to settle down. And all of your buildings as the Mongols, except for outposts and uh, docks, I think those are the only ones. Uh, they can be packed and unpacked and run around, including uh, all of your uh, landmarks. So that is a really important aspect of the civilization. Second, you don't need houses. It's like the Huns in Age of Empires 2. Just start with 200 population, no strings attached. Then you have their influence mechanic, which is really, really important for the civilization, more so than almost every civ in the game. We have buildings constructed within the influence of an Uvu uh, are able to double produce units or research improved versions of attack. So you can see here, I know I'm kind of jumping around a little bit, but I feel like this is going to be the most helpful for describing Mongols. The Uvu is a building you can create in the Dark Age. Actually, you cannot pack and unpack this guy either. It's 150 wood. It must be built on a stone outcropping. And what it will do is it'll automatically harvest stone for you. Um, it just doing it over time it'll slowly uh you know your stone stockpile will just tick up this means that you cannot mine stone by regular means that you have to get it through this uvu and you can only have one uvu at a time now in addition to providing a bunch of uh unique techs what this does is it will create an influence and the influence radius is um, a few tiles and like i mentioned units can be double produced when in the the influence of an uvu for an additional stone cost for instance you have your spearman right here. Costs 60 food, 20 wood. At the Uvu, for an additional stone cost, you can produce two spearmen at once for the cost of 60 food, 20 wood, and then some amount of stone. And it you know, varies depending on the unit. Which means that essentially you're getting another spearman or whatever unit for only costing stone, which is kind of weird. It's like, you know, we're building people out of stone? But no, that's just how it works in the game. Also, in case you're wondering, wait, I don't want to spend my stone on units. I need it for defenses. Yeah, you can't do that with Mongols. You cannot build walls. You cannot build keeps or castles. Uh, you can build outposts, and outposts are actually cheaper than uh, other civilizations. 70 wood, whereas they are generically uh, 100 wood. It's one of those unlisted bonus things that, uh, yeah, I, uh, I remember to mention now. Uh, so yeah, they are uh, cheaper. And uh, they only cost wood. Your town centers, here it correctly lists that town centers cost 900 wood with the Mongols, not 400 wood, 300 stone. So that's actually really expensive. I mean, 900 wood is a huge asking price, but still it doesn't cost any stone. And that just means all of your stone is just gonna be spent on double producing units, whatever that you want them to be. This can be utilized for a very powerful rush. You can use it to double pump villagers at the town center. Uh, and as it mentioned, create or research improved versions of specific techs. Now this isn't available for every tech. For instance, it doesn't work with like eco upgrades. 
uh, and it doesn't work with blacksmith upgrades, but there are a lot of other ones. Um, like, let's just find an example. So like with Siha Bow Limbs, like I'll talk about this more later, it increases the range of your Mangadai in the con by one. You can research it as normal, or you can get like a stone cost version, which is like that plus a stone cost, where it will increase the range of Mangadai, or range of Mangadai and Khan by two. And if you, you could, what you can do is you don't have, okay, let me, <laughs> this is hard to explain. So you can research the regular version, and that's all fine and dandy. You can also, instead of that, you can research the improved version for the additional stone cost. However, if you get the regular version, you can pay for the bonus version and you'll get that extra effect. So like you can get the regular version for plus one and then you can pay, you know, you're paying for more resources overall, but you can sort of get it in increments and then you can get that extra plus one range. So it does work like that. But all of this does require you to be in the influence of an Uvu, which means that you're going to be packing and unpacking uh, your buildings just so that you can uh, be around uh, your your stone generation thing, because that's just a really, really important aspect for the civilization that uh, I, I think it's important to be like, this is, like right up front, this is just super, super critical for the civilization. So with our basic understanding of Mongols in mind, let's go through the Civ bonuses. Plunder 50 food and gold by igniting enemy buildings, and you'd ignite enemy buildings by uh, getting them to a low enough HP threshold, and then, you know, there'll be a little fire icon, and then the building will take damage over time and eventually get destroyed. This can actually be a super powerful bonus early on, because you can get a few scouts out, and then you'll just like ignite a random mining camp or something like that. And then you'll just get 50 food and gold and also just destroy the enemy building. Next, all buildings can be picked up and redeployed to a new location. So I talked about this already. It's all of the buildings except for like your uh, docks and outposts and uh, stuff like that and uvus. This is really important for relocating your various buildings so that they can be near your uvus actually. So you can just double pump those units, get those improved versions of techs, and you'll just have to relocate those as you eventually, you know, deplete an area of stone. So it interestingly makes Mongols like the most stone reliant civilization in the game despite not being able to build any sort of defense. Also, this is a good time to talk about the uh, the town center rush. So, uh, if you guys have been watching any, like, streamers or probably YouTube videos as well, uh, you'll know that the, uh, the AOE4 is currently overrun by Mongol Town Center rushes. I'm not gonna talk about that for this video, because it is a silly strategy, um, and one that is almost certainly not intended for the game, and I feel like it is very likely that it will be patched out, or, you know, altered in some way, because... Unlike an AoE2, AoE2 with the, the Persian or Teuton TC drops being, like, it's a gimmick strategy and it's really annoying, but it's not actually OP. Like, this is actually OP in game-breaking. So I imagine this will be patched out. I don't know for sure, but I'm just going to, you know, <laughs> give uh, give Relic the benefit of the doubt and say that they're going to patch it out, so that's why I'm not going to talk about it in this video. As I mentioned, start with maximum population limit and have no need for houses, so you just start the game with a 7 out of 200 population. Ah, yes, here's something that's misleading. Early horsemen available in the Dark Age and early lancers in the Feudal Age. The early lancer thing is a lie. That's not the case. At all. Early lance or early knights are a thing for French and they're a thing for Rus, not not for Mongols. We can even see it here. Um, so yes, you can build stables in Dark Age, and this is why uh, they're such a powerful civilization. Ah, here, even in the tech tree itself, you can see that lancers you can only make in Castle Age, which is correct. So in the Dark Age, you can make early horsemen. And yes, this is... Very powerful for rushing. They do surprisingly good siege damage, and if you, like, double pump two of those guys out in early game, you just run in with your Khan, and, uh, yeah, you can start killing stuff really fast. Just pick off villagers that might have a gold mine that's far away from the town center, and, yeah, it's a very, very powerful bonus. You can stay in Dark Age for actually a good long while with Mongols just running over your opponent with uh, early horsemen. Uh, and then, of course, from there on, you'll just go, go out and go for your light cav. You have double produce units or research advanced technologies. Yeah, I already talked about this. Uh, gain plus 10% food, wood, gold, and stone from trade routes with more traders. Now, to be honest, guys, I don't really understand how this works. Um, as of the game's launch, there's no scenario editor in this game or genie editor or anything like that. So I can't test this. And I just don't have a good enough understanding of trade mechanics to really, unfortunately, give you guys a good like explanation of this. I assume you just get you get more resources. Like, bottom line, you get more resources. Seems good to me. But if somebody does know, then definitely uh, let, let everyone else know in the comments, because, uh, you know, we could all learn here. 
And then their naval bonus, transport ships have 50% more HP and move plus 15% faster. Uh, Mongols aren't a naval civilization. This is just allowing you to land more easily, so you can not have to play water. But pretty much there are no naval civilizations except for French and Russo. Uh, who cares? <laughs> so those are the civ bonuses, and you can see that, like, other than maybe the trade one, uh, you can just benefit from them in, like, Dark Age. Like, they are a super, super aggressive civilization. The most aggressive civ in the entire game. So, yeah, definitely, if, you, if you're playing Mongols, be ready to just reach out and punch face, because that is where the civilization is at their strongest. So, moving on now to the unique units, we have Khan! Fires a powerful signal arrows that enhance nearby troops. What the heck does that mean? So, with the Mongols, again, just to be, you know, even more confusing, you start with a Khan instead of a, an early scout or horseman or whatever. The Khan is essentially a Mangudai, which I guess I should get to as well. But just know for now that it's it's a Mangudai. I'll probably put the stats up on screen at some point if we're like Imperial Age. But it, it gets uh, stat buffs with every age you advance. So in Dark Age, it only does two damage, I believe. In combat, it's a strong Mangudai. That's not where the, the value of the unit is, though. Where the unit's value lies is in a bunch of different signal arrows. There's one for movement speed, and there's one for attack speed, and there might be other ones that I'm just not remembering because the sieve is so complicated. Um, there's also uh, like a falcon ability where you can like send up a scouting falcon to hang around an area for a little bit. So it's essentially a utility and support unit um, that's going to be really, really powerful to keep alive. If your Khan does die uh, after, I believe, a two-minute timer, it will just he'll, he'll come back from your town center. So yeah, that, that's the Khan. It is an important part of your army, and it's going to be there at all stages of the game. Also, I believe they have seven range, so it's a, it's a long range unit. So, of course, their other unique unit is the Mangudai. Mounted archer able to fire while moving. If that sounds horribly oppressive, you'd be right. <laughs> I'll put the stats up on screen. Uh, it, they are available at the archery range in this game, so not at the castle like an AoE 2, of course, because Mongols can't even get castles. And you could they cost 120 food and 40 gold, and they're... They're not, like, the fastest units in the world, but especially if you can get, like, the uh, movement speed buff from, like, the Yam network uh, or the Khan's ability, uh, they can be really fast. And because they can move and shoot and they actually deal decent damage, melee units that, like, and slow units just have no way of ever catching up. It can be one of the least interactive uh, things you could ever do in the game. Uh, so, yeah, it's an incredibly strong unit, but it is pretty expensive. They're pretty fragile. And the thing is, they don't scale that well into late game. Once you really get to, like, a ton of armor upgrades, I've seen, you know, Imperial Age Mongols just kind of, you know, they, they just fall off against most civilizations. Mongols are not the post-imp powerhouse that they are in AoE 2. Elite Mangudai are not going to shred everything in late game, as much as that saddens me. But, I mean, they're still going to be powerful, like, don't get me wrong. But don't expect to just win games with, like, hordes of pure Mangudai. They do have weakness. They are outranged by regular archers. And, you know, just anything with a ton of armor, and especially like uh, knights and stuff like that, they can just eventually just run them down. But they're still going to be probably your single most powerful unit, and I would be wrong to say that it's not going to be the core of most of your armies. So those are the unique units of Mongols, but they also have a bunch of unique buildings. Uh, I've already talked about the Uvu. You have the Jur, or Gur, I'm not too sure how you pronounce that. They're 100 wood, so they cost double the regular drop-off site. However... Um, it does serve as a drop-off site for food, wood, and gold. So essentially, it's a mining camp, lumber camp, and mill all bundled into one, and you can get all of your eco-upgrades here. So it's it's more expensive, uh, you can pack it and unpack it, and you can just go out and then do yo thang. It, it's like a, the ox wagon for Norse from Age of Mythology, except you have to pack it and unpack it. You get the idea. Oh, also uh, worth mentioning is that when you're researching a technology or producing a unit, you cannot unpack or pack. You have to the thing has to be idle for you to pack it or unpack it. But yeah, that's the that's the grr or jur. Then another very important building is the pasture. They are 150 wood, and they will automatically produce sheep every couple of minutes. Or it says 90 seconds or two minutes. I don't know. Every once in a while they produce sheep. Mongols can't build farms. They are not an agrarian culture. They are a nomadic culture. So these are your farms. Essentially, you just place several of these and then your villagers will just, you know, take from the sheep and then they'll just go around and around and around uh, to all of the different pastures gaining sheep over the course of a game. I believe you can have 30 sheep maximum, so it's not like you can stockpile sheep, uh, at least not too many. 
but this is just going to be your uh, your long-term food source, essentially, instead of farms. Now to the unique techs, and Mongols have plenty of them because, uh, you know, clearly not a confusing enough civilization. So the Uvu at the unique building, there are also a bunch of unique techs, of course. You have superior mobility, which allows your packed and unpacked buildings to uh, move faster, uh, which can be quite nice. Just, uh, you know, move around better. No TC rushing. Uh, whistling arrows means that the various signal arrows from your con, uh, you know, they'll, their effect lasts longer and it's in a larger radius, so again, Something you probably can't afford to early game, but can be nice to get in later, later on in the game. Raid Bounty, just double the amount of food and gold you get from a building. Probably not the most important thing in the world, but, you know, it, it can be nice. Additional Torches, increase the torch damage of all infantry and cavalry by three. You're probably not making too much infantry as Mongols, but still, uh, especially for cavalry, in late game it can be pretty nice. Uh, the torch damage uh, applies to siege units and uh, buildings, so you're just better at destroying buildings, which is pretty nice. And then an interesting one is you have Stone Bounty in Imperial Age, where you can get 75 stone from igniting a building. So it's like lots of stuff you get for lighting buildings on fire. Just Mongol things. Uh, but Mongols have their own means of late game stone production, so in case you're wondering, oh man, if the stone runs out of the map, is my or my Uvu's gonna be useless? Well, I mean, I guess the Uvu's might be, but uh, you'll, you'll have your means for stone, don't you worry. The barracks is generic. Yeah. At your stable, I already talked about the uh, the early horseman as it is a unique unit-ish kind of for the civilization. It's a bonus. And other than that, their lancers are, again, completely generic, uh, but still lancers are a good unit. So that's not too much of an issue. And again, lancers are literally just knights. They're just renamed knights, or knights are renamed lancers. Same thing. You do have a unique tech at the dock, piracy, and you gain 50 wood and gold from sinking an enemy ship. And you need food... food uh, yeah, you need wood and gold to make more ships, so it's like you're getting resources you need to make ships from sinking enemy ships. It's honestly kind of a win more thing, and uh, like I said, uh, unless you're named Roos or French, you literally don't care about water, because you're gonna <laughs> you're gonna have a bad time. Uh, yes, the Yam network. I forgot to talk about that. So, uh, at the outpost, you have the, uh, the Yam aura thing, which increases the speed of nearby cavalry and traders. So yeah, this uh, Yam network thing, it implies to all units. You can also get other another Yam network bonus later on. Yeah, but that's just like, it's another thing. So actually you have a unique tech at the market and that is stone commerce. Having nine or more traders causes them to supply stone as well as gold. So that's one of the uh, ways that I was saying that you can get stone later on in the game, like, you know, infinitely. So you can keep on double producing units or getting the more powerful versions of your techs in the late game. All right, so the blacksmith is just a blacksmith, right? I mean, you can pick it and you can pack it up and unpack it with Mongols, but otherwise it's pretty much what you'd expect except for the fact that it is also a university. It has your relevant university text in late game that you can get with the civilization uh, because Mongols, uh, they, they ain't about that book learning. So yeah, you can get these texts in Imperial Age and just get them from the blacksmith and you don't get a uh, university. Archery range, I've already talked about the Mangudai and I've even mentioned the Sihabo limbs. So you can increase the range of Mangudai and the Khan and you can even increase it more with, uh, you know, the stone version. And uh, Mangudai have a pretty short range, so getting more range just means that the unit is much more useful in the mid to late game, especially against archers, because the less that archers outrange you, then the better you're going to be doing versus them. The Prayer Tent is your version of a monastery. The Monastic Shrines allows improved production in their districts even without an Uvu, so it won't generate stone for you, but you can still double pump units and, uh, you know, get the improved versions of technologies uh, when you're located near the prayer shrine. So again, just making sure that the uh, the stone uvu thing is not only an early game thing. And the siege workshop is pretty much generic. So those are the unique texts of Mongols. I'm sure you get the idea. Again, all about aggression, all about mobility, double pumping out units, getting improved versions of technologies, and just getting a momentum early on and then, uh, you know, not letting go. One of the ways that that helps you out, by the way, is you have two very powerful Feudal Age landmarks. You have Deer Stones, which uh, immediately gives you the Yam speed aura. What this means is that no matter where you are on the map, all of your units move faster. Like, all of your units just get a speed buff whenever the building is set up, which is pretty darn nice. Uh, it, it helps, you know, it's like, it helps everything, uh, especially for your Mangudai to better outrange, uh, you know, run away and, and shoot and all that stuff. However, it does have some stiff competition from the Silver Tree, which acts as a market and can build traders 50% faster and at a 50% reduced gold cost. And you can also, if you build it near an Uvu, you can double pump out trade units. So 
you can go for a really strong trade boom uh, in Feudal Age with Mongols. Just build a bunch of traders, send them to one of those uh, neutral market sites, and uh, supplement your income uh, in that way and sort of use it as a second town center almost. In the Castle Age, we have the Curl Tie, which when a Khan is nearby, the Curl Tie heals all nearby units and provides a 25% damage bo bonus for 30 seconds. This is really nice, and it's going to be kind of weird because what you, at least what, uh, you know, high level players have been doing, at least from what I've seen, is you pack up your Curl Tie and you just send it out with your army. So it's like you're, you have your landmark and it's just going out with your army, and it'll just heal off all of your units. You know, you hit and run and then you run away again, and just get that bonus so long as the Khan is nearby. And again, Make sure you keep your con safe. But if you want to go for the more economic route, you have the Step Redoubt, which acts as a Gur or Jer, and gold dropped off at this landmark is increased by 50%. So this can be a nice boost to your uh, gold income, and it also is, again, a, just a drop-off site. So more gold, good stuff, yeah. Imperial Age, we have the White Stupa, which acts as an Uvu and produces 240 stone per minute without a stone outcropping. Again, this is infinite stone income. You can always have access to stone for an entire game, no matter what, with the Uvu and it also me or with the White Stupa, and it means that you also get the uh, if you have your buildings nearby, you can double pump out units, which is also good. If you want the more military route, you have the uh, Kaganet Palace, which will spawn an army of horsemen, Mangudai, or lancers every ninety seconds, and essentially it's just a few free units that you're getting. Um, I believe the number of units depends on what what you're making so you get the the most horsemen and then mangudai and then lancers I, I i'm pretty sure honestly i feel like that one's not quite as useful as the white stupa because again just having infinite stone income is pretty important but uh eh, that's just me and then of course your wonder is going to be the monument of the great khan and so guys that is the mongols an incredibly powerful civilization one that even without the whole town center rushing thing, I think is just going to be one of, if not like the most powerful civs in the entire game. I put them in S tier for my uh, civilization tier list on launch day. They're good, guys. Uh, they have a pretty high learning curve. So don't just like pick up Mongols and expect to like know how to do everything. It's not it's, it's not that simple. So definitely be willing to give the civ some time just to figure out all the little intricacies. There's probably plenty of stuff that I missed in this video as well. But again, let me know in the comments. And uh, yeah, thank you all so much for enjoying. Leave a like if you found this useful, and I'll see you guys next time.